Yeah. So, Jim. Yeah. I usually start our phone conversations like in the middle of a sentence. You notice that? I'll usually have something I want to ask you and I'll just ask instead of saying hello. I, I don't. Okay, let's assume that's true. So <laughs> lay it on me. Um, yeah, um, we talked about topics. I, I haven't, I really, I really haven't settled on one. I thought what we were talking about um, the other night was, was great. What was that? Um, and I think it had to do, um, you started talking about some books that you did not like that you had read recently. Uh, and then we got into World War II, of course. Um, from from not liking a science fiction novel that you had just recently read, right? Um, but I read another book. I read two yeah. books. I read a science quote unquote science fiction work that I, I didn't enjoy, although everybody else seemed to enjoy it. Um, and then I read a, a book about World War II that I found extraordinarily tedious um, hmm. and fine grained, but really illuminating, really. You know, I mean, it's fun after a while just to be surprised. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's one thing, you know, after a while you start reading history books and they just seem to be repeats of everything you've heard before. And then every now and then somebody comes out with a book that just really opens your eyes to something you never thought about. It was a good book. Do you remember the name? Do you know what, can I remember what Hitler's it was? American Gamble or Hitler's America Gamble. And it was it was uh, featured in the walls in the New York Times. Um, uh, and do we give a brief synopsis? Sure. I just want to say, first of all, of course, it was if it was featured in the New York Times, then we must we must all attest to the quality of that book. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> usually the quality is pretty good in general. The stuff that the New York Times recommends it's just not my cup of tea sometimes. Um, and this one was like the New York Times, tedious and detail oriented, but still informative um, and uh, basically uh, what the authors talked about was that uh, of course we all know uh, December 7th 1941 Japanese Empire uh, bombs Pearl Harbor right and people consider that a pivotal moment which it is what these what these gentlemen it's two authors I believe um, state is that just as pivotal was and this is where Lionel screws up the date, just as pivotal <laughs> is December 12th, I hope, I probably should look this up, December 12th, 11th or 12th, where Hitler announces that the Third Reich has declared war on America. Right. And uh, do you remember whether it, was, whether it was the United States or was it was, uh, you know, the whole continent? I mean, the, the Americas, you know... Uh, Versus well, he, he had no beef with South America. There was no uh, the only the, the thing I may be screwing up is did he declare war in America? Or did he declare war? Well, he was already at war with England, right? And he was already at war with yeah. It's war in America. He right. declared war in America, um, which is very counterintuitive. Makes no sense whatsoever that he would do such a thing, right? You know, just if if you're a normal schlub like you and me, it's like why did he do that? Um, and and the, the authors hold out the promise that they're going to answer that. And I don't think they do. Huh. I don't think they do. I don't think they have a really good answer to that. I think they have a couple of theories. But what's more important about the book, and I think which is the great value of the book, is they said between those two days, between Pearl Harbor and between Hitler's declaration, history could have gone in a million different directions. Right. Right. And in fact, what they said is that history actually went in one of the most violent and catastrophic directions. Huh. Interesting. Because you'd think, well, it all worked out great. We right. won. You know, it's <laughs> like, how could that be bad? And they said, well, yeah, you won, but a tremendous cost. Um, and one of the most interesting things that they talk about, which I had never really thought about, and I never really knew, is they said, uh, you know, one of the phrases they keep repeating is that, as of December 7th, 1941, most of Europe's Jews were in very precarious position, but they were still alive. Huh. But after December 12th, things moved very quickly after, after December 12th. The Von C conference happens a week or two weeks after uh, December 12th, and the Third Reich goes into high gear on the final solution. Um, and they make the statement, 
I don't know if it's true because I've never heard from anybody else um, that Hitler was sort of holding the Jews hostage for America's huh. good behavior. And that if America entered and he was using the, the, the he, he refrained from persecuting the Jews any further um, to ensure America's good behavior. I've never heard that before in my life. But then yes. again, I haven't read a lot, that many books about this thing. But the one thing I do agree with them on, regardless, is that, and it, it makes sense because you don't need to know anything, is that between December 7th, 1941, and December 12th, history could have gone in a million different directions. Um, and that the Japanese made very specific decisions um, right. that really changed the path of history. And Hitler made very specific decisions, and Stalin made very specific decisions, and they all, they could have made all different kinds of decisions. Right. Um, so anyway, I'll pause there because no, I, no. I think you know, I think one of the things that I, you were saying that that really got me thinking was uh, the Japanese could have gone north, um, and uh, uh, and uh, into into Russia, which would have changed everything. Well, um, actually, what the authors point out the the thing that's really puzzling is, you know, the, the one of the key challenges facing the Japanese was lack of access to natural resources. They didn't have access to oil, to anything practically. <clears throat> right. Because America was slowly standing on, on the windpipe of the Japanese empire. Um, and what they could have done, what the Japanese could have done to lay that, is they could have just attacked um, the English empire. They could have just attacked Britain. Huh. Because Britain had Malaya, Malaysia, and right. Singapore, and Hong Kong, and all this stuff. And then the Dutch had Borneo, which is really important, and they attacked Borneo. So you could have declared war on the Dutch, you could have declared war on the English, gotten what you needed, right? and not pull America into the war. Because the Japanese and the Germans, everybody was absolutely crystal clear that if you pull America into the war, chances are <laughs> you're going to get obliterated. They huh. knew that. They Even back it. then, I mean, I mean, we oh. weren't really a global superpower, you know, so much. We I guess maybe superpower. World War One, yeah, but but we were a productive superpower. Right. We were we were outproducing everybody else, and everybody knew. Stalin knew. The great quote in the book is Stalin said, "This is a war of engines, and whoever makes the most engines wins." Right. Um, and so they all knew. They all knew that if you dragged America into this, that you're going to get clobberized. Um, and the key thing was that America had refused to be dragged into the war, mainly through the, the, uh, the force of the isolationist sentiment within America at that time. The America First Committee is the most famous one with Charles Lindbergh. Um, right. So there's huge pressure against Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Keep America out of the war. And everybody, it seems like up until December 7th, everybody was happy to do that. Everybody's right. like, well, if you leave America alone, they'll leave you alone. But the problem was America was supplying tons of weaponry to via the Lend-Lease Act to England and to Russia. And so what the author's books say um, is that Hitler just said, I'm at war with them anyway. Uh, I'm hmm. at war with America anyway, so might as well. But it's not a satisfactory explanation. But anyway, so, but again, back to the original point, if the Japanese had just declared war against the British Empire and taken Hong Kong, Singapore, um, Malay, and stuff like that, they could have possibly could have gotten what they wanted without bringing the world's largest industrial power, uh, pissing off the <laughs> world's largest industrial power. Right. So it's really strange. It's really, but the funny thing is they both acted the same way. Hitler, the, the Third Reich and the, the Japanese Empire acted the same way. They said, ah, screw it. Piss. <laughs> Go ahead. Throw that at America. Go ahead. Right. See what he, it's like, what are you, what are you guys thinking? And the the authors say what they were thinking is that they knew they were they knew they were dead. Really? They yeah. They knew the the phrase that the Japanese use is it's a choice between going poor slowly or going poor quickly. Wow. Um, so they, they they was the uh, Japanese, not the not the Germans. Yeah, but they're both saying base. I mean, the, Hitler never explained his thinking. The Japanese clearly did. I mean, the Japanese were clearly aware. There's, there's many famous quotations from the Japanese generals basically saying, we're screwed. Huh. We know we're screwed. Um, and so anyway, so it was, it's an interesting book because it's literally minute by minute. 
and they go from they they go to Tokyo and Berlin, Washington D.C., Rome, where they talk about Benito Mussolini and what he was doing. And they go they literally go minute by minute looking at newspaper accounts. Um, they spend a lot of time heartbreaking. They spend a lot of time in saying in Latvia. You yeah. know, the Jews were being boarded on boxcars yeah. um, and that the uh, all the people who were in, um, I think it was the Riga ghetto, were slaughtered to make space for more Jews that were being trans-shipped across Europe from another. I mean, it's just harrowing. Oh, it's God. absolutely harrowing. Um, and uh, so I actually, I found it a really tedious book, but a really, really educational and informative book. Oh, it sounds fascinating. And that, yeah. uh and that, oh, sorry, the title was uh, Hitler's uh, America or American Gamble. Gamble. I should huh. probably find out. Let me. Can I can, on a podcast here? You can add. Yeah, you can look up anything you want. Okay, let me just we don't have look. to, you know, rely on our memories. It's uh, it's uh, that American a, American Gamble. Hitler's American Gamble. Um, they, which is on this blurb says it is a riveting account. I, hmm. I, hmm. I debate that statement, <laughs> um, by Brendan Sims, two M's and Charlie Laderman, L A D E R M A N. It's, I don't consider it a riveting account, but I consider it a very, um, a very excellent account. And I just lost you. Oh, my, you did? Hang on, I'll find you at some point. There you oh, go. Oh yeah, you mean the in the browser uh, yeah. mess? Um, so I, what I guess I don't. I mean, I'll, we can leave it. We can leave it shortly. But um, what I don't understand is why Hitler wouldn't have been smarter and waited until he had more things in place before trying to engage somebody across the world. Um, why? Well, he was. Yeah, he was never going to have anything more in place. See, what's it? That's fascinating because one of the, the, the – it's really good. It, it actually is a good book. Huh. It actually is a good book because one of the things they said is that so much was ha- happening in that short time of period, in that short time period. And the other thing that was happening on December 7th was that um, the, the Wehrmacht had re- reached the absolute limit of its conquests. Um, and th- it's a great – it's a fabulous story because the Soviets had a spy – in Tokyo called Richard mm. Sorgo. And Richard Sorgo's job number one, Richard Sorgo, was to tell Stalin whether the Japanese intended to invade Russia in the east. And Richard uh. Sorgo, and in, 19, in, in October, November, December of 1941, the Nazis, the Nazis had launched Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of Russia. And in October, November, December, they had gotten to their farthest penetration they got within like 10 miles of the Kremlin they got within 100 miles of Lenin I mean they pushed enormously in had had captured hundreds of thousands of Soviet soldiers as prisoners right um, and and seemed unstoppable and then they stopped because of the Russian winter and then what what Stalin did because Richard Sorgas says the Japanese are not going to attack you Stalin transfers, I think, 20 divisions of Siberian troops from all the way over in <laughs> East Russia, all the thing, and clobberizes the Wehrmacht and sends it reeling. Yeah. So, this is the first time that the German, that the Wehrmacht, the, German, the, the Army of the Third Reich, actually had to retreat en masse, and they're retreating backwards. And Hitler says, do not retreat. You can't retreat. And all the and and he fires all. And the generals say, "Dude, there's no way we can stop them." I mean, right. there it's it's just hopeless situation. And Hitler eventually, I think, fires the general and takes personal command of the Eastern Front. But he can't stop it either. Right. Um, so what's happening? And I think what that is is that's the realization that this is game over. Right. We're done. We didn't knock England out of the war. We didn't. The, the 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 battle of Britain didn't work. Right. We're, we're we're not sinking as much shipping as we needed to sink to to do this thing, and we're not. It's not going to happen. And we didn't knock Russia out of the war. It's game over. Uh. I think I think part of you has to think that, and therefore your two choices are one, set f- suicide, right. or B, you try to negotiate. A ceasefire. Yeah, negotiating is very different than saying, you know, hey, you <laughs> over there. 
You right. too. You know. Yeah, you don't you don't start negotiations <laughs> by declaring war on people. I I don't know. Right. I'm not an expert in diplomacy and war making, but I would say that's not exactly my in, the intuitive first step is to declare war on somebody that you want to negotiate with. Uh, I don't know, but I mean I'm being sort of flip. But who who knows? Right. But I don't think the book really answers it. Hmm. I don't think the book really answers it, and I, I'm not sure we'll ever know. Um, but a lot of things were going on at that time. Basically, I think the, the, there was the first clear evidence that for, to Germany that this was not going to work out. Right. Um, and also, at the same time, by December 12th, it was pretty clear to Japan that this was not going to work out well either. Because, I mean, the classic statement, you know, the one that everybody repeats is, you know, the aircraft carriers weren't at Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But even if they were there, I think there's a lot of voices within Japan saying this is like a really bad idea. <laughs> well, right. I mean, it also it's uh, yeah. I mean, you're you're you know you're dealing at, at one point with with everything close to your continent, and then you've decided to go out into the middle of the Pacific and and mm -hmm. and mess around, and and that's a weird choice, right? I mean, it doesn't seem like a necessary choice, and but of course. If you're saying they're feeling like they've already lost, um, it's just an odd way to you know go big or go home. Well, their um, hope the 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 classic explanation of what the Japanese Empire was trying to achieve was that they would go into Pearl Harbor, they would find air, they would find the vast majority of the U.S. Pacific Fleet and send it to the bottom of the ocean. Right, and America would have no choice but to negotiate. Ah, uh. to say okay. Japan, you can have blah, 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 you know, leave, leave the Philippines alone, you know, leave Australia alone, but you can have this, that, and you can have free reign in China, uh, in Mongolia and stuff like that. And um, it didn't work out that way. Right. It didn't work out that way. And I, they, they didn't count upon missing the aircraft carriers, but I think they also didn't really count on America being like really pissed off. Um, and there's the famous quote. I think from Admiral uh, Yamamoto, who said, I fear we've only served to waken a sleeping giant and fill right. it with a terrible resolve. And there's like a hundred other people who said basically the same thing, which is, we're screwed. Got it. And I think, and, and a lot of them said, you've got a year. <clears throat> we can hold the Americans off for about a year. And that's about it. So if I were you, I'd pick up the phone and <laughs> maybe send them some flowers or something <laughs> like that and start some kind of dialogue. Because I, I can hold them off for, I, I forget who said, but he said, I can hold them off for a year, maybe two on the outside, and that's it. And after mm -hmm. that, we're screwed. Right. Um, but the Japanese had their backs to the wall. They, they had no access to natural resources. America was standing in their way. It's a... Uh, and so, what do you do? Right, right. What do you do? Either you negotiate or you, you do a, a very violent, unannounced thing to try to change the dynamic. You know, desperate times call for desperate measures, and they believe they're, they're in a desperate situation. And so you do a desperate thing, which is, um, you know, they try to... Uh, anyway... <clears throat> It's all water under the bridge, but I, I guess the most interesting thing about the book, all in all, is one, there are periods in history where individual choices make huge differences in the timelines. Right. You know, we, we tend to think, you know, sometimes we think, you know, oh, well, it's all just impersonal forces. It's all, you know, individuals are really not important. We're all just rolling down the groove that was set for us. I don't think that's true at all. Um, I think it's true 99.999% of the time for 99.999% of the people. But I think at rare times, for rare groups of people, all the cards get thrown up in the air. Um, and it's what you decide to do. And, so and it comes down to one spy in, uh, in Japan. Yeah. Yeah. Who's right. a drunk? A womanizer. <laughs> I mean, Richard so I really like Richard Sorka. He's... <laughs> everything about like he would get drunk he would get drunk and then sit he was like in in berlin he'd get drunk and, and sit down with like ss officers and say ah f i'm a i'm a soviet spy you knuckleheads and they would and they would all laugh with him it's all oh, richard we love you you're so funny you make us laugh and it's like the fate of the world is hanging on this guy. Right. A, there's a great quote in there which is that at one point he had this mission and and um 
he had, and it was such a tough mission that he said, I gave up drinking for like six months. He said, I didn't, I didn't have a drink for six months. And, and they, and he said, I will never be able to drink enough in the rest of my life to make up for that six months. <laughs> so anyway. well, I've, got, I've got a pivot. <clears throat> Here's Good. a pivot. Um, okay. th- this reminds me of um, a writer you and I have both read, uh, we, I think we both like a lot, um, of a, um, I haven't, I've only read one of his books, but it was, it was so devastating. I'm not sure I'm ready to read the next one. Um, it's Paolo Bacigalupi and, yeah. uh, and his, um, it's not the water knife. It's, um, the wind up girl, the wind up girl. Yeah. yeah. And his depiction of the calorie man who's, um, in Malaysia, Malay. I think it's Bangkok, Bangkok. I think it's oh, Thailand. It is. Oh, okay. Yeah, because they talk really about clear. the pumps. The t- yeah. I think there's the pumps that surround the pump. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. But anyway, yeah, Paolo. Yeah, and they put up they put up uh, you know walls against the ocean uh, all around the city. And, yeah. Um, and uh, series series of diseases that just wiped out just both crop diseases and both and uh, human diseases have wiped out <clears throat> so much of the food and so many of the people. And into it comes uh, this corporate calorie man uh, who's. Uh, uh, oh, and I forget. I've forgotten all the all the like the business names, the company names. Um, but he's basically a drunk, and he shows. Oh no, it's no, it's this contact who's a drunk, um, and they and they end up trying to broker a deal with uh, the local government to allow uh, some grain of some breed of grain to come in. I think that is we'll, it a calorie? Is there a calorie? Because what I remember the main the main character in, in Wind Up Girl is this guy who's working at. A startup company that's building one gigajoule coiled springs to store energy, right? Right, and but in fact, he's he, he's a spy, and right. what he's really doing is sabotage. He's he's getting ready to sabotage the entire thing. Uh, yeah, and he's trying to figure out. I yeah, I I haven't read the book in a while, but yeah, he's the one. And we can't give the we can't give the plot away, can we? We have to not be too much. Uh, you not know, too enough, much. Enough to get people interested. It's a great book to read. It. Oh, it's fabulous. Yeah. It's fabulous. It's got it's got um, it's got Joseph Conrad in it. You know, right. like the 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 European guy in the middle of the jungle. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and and there's with ulterior also the, motives. Yeah. Right. With ulterior motives, so it's like Lord Jim, um, and <laughs> then the Conrad book, Lord Jim. But it's also a little bit of like um, John Le Carre. You know, the spy thriller, the down and out guy who falls in love. Right. Um, oh yeah, now, that's all very disturbing. That is. That is. That was. That was oh. very odd. Saying that something in a Paolo G- Bacigalubi book is disturbing. Yeah, it just it's like a pointless well. remark. In fact, I just as I as you're talking about this, I thought about something, which is when I first read Paolo, when I first read The Wind Up Girl, I thought, man, this is a really dark, I mean a really dark and unhappy vision of the future. And now I think he's an optimist. Uh-huh. I mean, when I look back on Paolo, I'm like Dude, I, I, I think you, I think, I think you've got like a little tender part in your soul because your vision of the future is looking more and more like what the future is like. I mean, he's he is unrelenting towards um, agribusinesses, right? Yeah, unrelenting towards that, unrelenting towards genetic engineering, unrelenting towards the the the, the conflict between the the privileged world um, and the third world. I mean everything. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, and to, Ugh. and technology falls apart so hard that they have to create these physical spring batteries in order to get anything to move. Yeah, um, and everything's being sent by zeppelin, like by blimps and things. That's the opening scene. Uh, right. The, the, I can't give it away, but the opening scene with the minister of trade and the minister of right. something or and that's and it's all it's all tragic. But he's it's a great book. It's a great book. So anyway, yep. you brought that book up. What do you? What, I don't know. It just because it seemed like um, so much in his book, and I think this makes fiction work really well. Is when events hinge on an individual, um, or they seem to uh, they seem to revolve around uh, a series of uh, of individuals. And I felt like them, and it wasn't him. <clears throat> it wasn't him, but it was it was his contact with the calorie companies, which are big corporations that are basically trying to control. Um, all the food, 
Right, because um, they engineer the diseases. The, co- the calorie companies are not only designing the plant genomes that they sell to the world, but they design the diseases that will kill off those plants 20 years in the future. I mean, the, right. Palo Bacigalupi sort of shows at the very end of the book, there's like a, a stray comment from one of the calorie men that rev- rev- confirms that, which is that we're going to sell you, we're going to sell you the, we're going to sell you the, uh, the fixes for uh, root, uh, you know, uh, blade rust um, right. and this thing. And we'll sell you, we'll sell you cures to the ones we haven't even released in the, that we've designed, but haven't released in the wild yet. Right. That's the, that's the best offer they can make is, is like, you know, listen, a special offer for you. We'll get it's you just, ahead of the curve. It's just horrible. It's a yeah. brutal, brutal, brutal thing because that whole that whole issue of uh you know the there that's a huge that's a huge discussion about the the uh engineering of the sterile crops you know if you right. go to these major crop companies and you buy your seed it's all sterile um so you can't you have to go back to the seed companies to buy it over and over again anyway anyway that's a long conversation right, but right. yeah palo palo <laughs> palo bacha Galupi. um he but he's you know like i think like any great author I think, you know, this, uh, this is a long topic, you know, what makes a great, you know, what makes great art? <laughs> let's, pick, <laughs> let's pick a small topic. Yeah, let's, we've got a couple of minutes. Um. <laughs> you know, what makes great art? And I think one, I think there's many things that perhaps make great art. But one thing I, th- I find fascinating about a lot of artists is that they, they manage to combine different elements really effectively. Like they, mm. take, they take two or three things um, that don't necessarily connect, um, or that people haven't hooked up together, and they bring them together. Um, I think of, I, I, and this is where I'm going to get into enormous trouble with everybody in the plan. I think of Jimi Hendrix. Oh, Jimi Hendrix is a you know, African American blues guitarist. Right. Um, so far, you're on safe ground. I think. Yeah, I magnificent yeah. guitarist yeah. who puts on. The, the the wild psychedelic clothes of of England in the late 1960s, the Carnaby right. Street clothes, and does that stuff and goes over to England and does psychedelic stuff. But right. he's a two-fisted blues guitarist. And the third thing he sucks into it is electronics. Now he's got phase shifters and right. flangers, and he's doing things with electronics that nobody's ever done before. And he's and you know, and he does that whole um, uh, uh, national anthem, right? Um, uh, and Star Spangled Banner at Woodstock, where he's doing things that nobody's. I mean, right. certainly nobody's done on that big a stage before. So it's really interesting. You have a you have a, a man who is comes from a very solid. Musical tradition, you know the blues. I think he was, I think he was a rhythm guitarist for James Brown. I'm, I'm probably missing, but he, he uh, was a rhythm guitarist for somebody very significant. He had a significant career as a blues, straight up blues guitarist. Then you add in sort of the English thing, the English psychedelic thing. Then right. you add in the electronics, and boom, that's art. Um, our disclaimer will be something like. Um Lionel and Jim are experts in nothing, and uh, <laughs> nobody should take anything they say as the word of truth in any conceivable form. Well, I'm hedging. Uh, I'm being. I'm hedging my stuff very carefully. If you notice, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not saying. But I. I do know that <laughs> Jim. I do know that Jimmy Hendrix was of was of African descent and is a guitarist. And I know that he. And he was a blues player. I mean, just listen to him play. Um, and um, and I seem to remember he 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 gigged, but he um, then went to England uh, right. with a huge intervention. Uh, supposedly, Paul McCartney had a lot to do with that. He goes to England, does the Carnaby Street thing, gets psychedelic, and then on top of that, he he takes a Univibe um, phase shifter pedal and turns his amp up to 12. <laughs> and so it's really interesting. It's really interesting. Here's an artist who's grabbing like these different pieces and sort of plugging them together. And you're like, oh, those things really do go together. Those right. are really cool. It fits with that idea of, is it, is it, uh, it might be Claude Levi Strauss talks about bricolage. And um, this is all stuff that I, you know, when I had to read about the post-structuralists, um, 
And uh, oh, I the, hated that. I had to do that uh, too. I'm, I'm just joking. No, <laughs> I never. Uh, uh, yeah, no. It, it, I mean, it, it's funny. I mean, the the overlay in terms of what we're talking about, post structuralists, were, I believe, were very famous for saying that there is no kind of, you know, great man in history. That it's really a uh, that it's really the forces um, of systems at work, but. Um, but that it, yeah, I, I believe Claude Levi Strauss talked about bricolage as kind of co- the collection of um, uh, cultural um, uh, uh, stories and styles that that kind of becomes um, the art in uh, the colonial world. But I, I could be making all that up. Um, the uh, but then isn't it just then it comes down to who's first? I mean, uh, if you're the first person to pull out the the electronics and, you know, somebody's either you've put to, you've soldered together a, a phase shifter or someone has like made one and you decided to plug it in. I'm thinking of uh, somebody like, um, you know, Brian Eno getting his Moog, you know, his, uh, or Moog um, synthesizer. Uh, they were there. The equipment was there, but there was something there was something new that was being done with them. Well, don't that, don't bring don't bring Brian into this because there's a great I'm sorry. There's a yeah, great, no. just you know, uh, there's a great um, documentary on YouTube called "The Man Who Fell to Earth," and so uh-huh. and and it's about Brian Eno's early years. I love the title because that's of course the title of the David Bowie movie, right? And so the the intimation is you know, and so with David Bowie, it was an intimation that he was like an alien, he's from another planet, right. which I never really, which I never really felt with David Bowie. I thought he was very much a human being. Brian, you know, it's a completely different thing altogether. <laughs> and also because David Bowie's career was very, very, was very, very um, standard. He, uh, in some ways, he, he was a singer songwriter right. who had a band and became famous, uh, really famous. I mean, like really, really famous, but fundamentally a very straight road. When you look at Brian, you career, it is totally launched. He he he's an art student. He plays keyboards for Roxy Music. Right. Uh, and anyway, but what we got to is, um, you know, I'm sorry. How do we get on this, Brian? You know, uh, yeah. How did Brian I mean, enter this conversation? We're talking about bricolage. Yeah. Oh, who's the first guy to do something? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's pretty standard. I mean, I mean, Jimmy had great jobs. I mean, Jimmy sounded right. fabulous, so that helps a lot too. Um, and he was discovered, and you know he got a big lift from Paul McCartney and people like that. But he was he was a ferocious talent, um, and so uh, that's but, I mean though, that's absolutely true. I mean you can you can be the first one to put together new ideas and do it in such a terrible way that people rightfully don't pay attention, and or nobody pays attention anyway, even if you are talented. Right. I mean, fair enough. You know, but going back to Paolo Bacigalupi, the interesting thing with him which, will, of course, starts to veer us into deep waters that we will not go into today. Okay. Um, I like those waters. Okay. Sort of like the science fiction author, who will not be named, that we've talked about many times, um, <laughs> which is that he grabs these elements, you know, that element of, like, the colonial, the col- you know, the European colonial servant, the spy in right. the jungle. And he grabs that element. And then he grabs... He grabs other elements, um, just a lot of that element of like in the third world. He grabs those elements, but then he layers in these really heavy um, global technological equity issues like genetic engineering and things right. like that and the collapse. And of course, it's a post collapse. In his thing, it's the collapse of petroleum. Right. Um, which I don't think I'm giving anything away. That happens, you know, that in the first two pages. Um, but also, you know, the, the stresses within government. I think he pulls a lot of different components together. As I said, he has a little bit of John Le Carre. He has a little bit of Joseph Conrad. Um, and and he makes it, and and a lot of horror. I mean, not horror, but just really. Oh, it, it is, yeah. Really grinding. No, the bad guys all win. Right, um, and it's just oh, so you gave that away. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, but uh, okay, sorry, you can add that one up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anyway. no, it's a it's a tremendous read. Um, yeah, it's really. Uh, 
I never I, read The Water Knife. I should really, because I started reading The Water Knife. I'm like, oh my God, do I really I want pa- Paolo in my head again? Me too. Me too. I started The but, Water Knife and I was like, I, didn't, I wasn't ready. But I will tell you something. There's absolutely a Paolo thing you have to read. Okay. Absolutely you have to read. What is it? He, he has a collection of short stories called Pump Six and Other Stories. Oh. I don't really like the other stories. Pump Six is absolutely hilarious. It Excellent. Is, Absolutely hilarious. It is completely depressing and absolutely funny. And you can use it as a um, as a um, as a code word with your friends, <laughs> your quote unquote friends. Because I, I did at 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 where I work, um, I I convinced one of my colleagues to read this story, and she can, and after that she was like, "Oh my god, I'm so glad you turned me into that story." And like every other week, we'd pass each other in the hallway, and she'd look really unhappy about something. And I, I look at her and she goes, Pump Six. <laughs> That's all I have to say is Pump Six. <laughs> You've got to read Pump Six. All right, six. I'm on it. I'm okay. On it. Well, I mean, what the else? last book of short stories you, uh, you recommended was uh, Swanwick. Tale- Swanwick, yeah. Tales of Old Earth. And that was just really, that was incredible from start to finish. Um, uh, some stories, you know, stronger than others, but just, uh, just incredible. Michael Swanwick is who we're talking about. And, um, this book, this collection is it just it just knocked me flat. It was just it was just wonderful. I think you liked you you were uh, in favor. even his bad stories are good. Yeah. Even his bad stories are absolutely memorable. I mean, you cannot shake Michael Swanwick from your head. You the, really um, can. Yeah, yeah. What was it? The one that we I think we both didn't like as much. But was it ri- riding the Megasaur? Was that? Or well, he did two. He did. Um, he did something like Scherzo with Tyrannosaur or something like that. He did two yeah. about dinosaurs, but one's when like this 1980 suspender wearing Wall Street broker type A <laughs> cocaine snorting philander his his body gets transferred into a Tyrannosaurus Rex. It's a totally irresponsible story and right. absolutely hilarious. It's right. a great. Great, great story, but yeah, it's not great science fiction. <laughs> well, it's different different degrees of great. I mean, they're, they're, uh, my favorite was um, uh, uh, Radiant Doors um, from that book, and I talk think about yours... an unhappy story. Talk about something that makes Paolo Bacigalupi look like Disney. Yeah, that's Radiant really, Doors is really Ugh. scary. I mean, yeah. real horror sci fi, and. Um, more whimsical and kind of beautiful was the Raggle Tackle Gypsio. Um, That's my number one. I mean, my big yeah. three, the three that I, I recommend to everybody, if they can't, number one, if they, can't, if they can only read one, read the Raggle Tackle Gypsio. Right. If they can read three, it's the Raggle Tackle Gypsio, Microcosmic Dog, mm-hmm. and um, mm-hmm. Mother Grasshopper. Oh, okay. um, I think uh, Microcosmic Dog... You have to be of a certain age to appreciate Microcosmic Dog because it's all about New York in the early 1980s. Um, although it's not. It has nothing to do with New York in the early 1980s. and has everything to do with... It's basically a science fiction version of Bright Light's Big City by Jay McInerney. It's so <laughs> funny. It's such a funny story. It's such a great story. But yeah. Um, yeah, he's a treasure. I mean, yeah. Swanwick's a treasure. Um and that's you know that's an interesting concept, which is you know the authors who do great great on short stories, you know what's the difference between a short story and a novel? Some short stories are just so beautiful. I mean, and you don't want them to turn into novels. Right, right. No, I, I I'm thinking about that because I'm working on short stories uh, myself, and I th- you know the difference between the the way they end, the arc is different, um, and Swanwick is probably a great way for me to kind of tackle them just to think about you know where do you start and where do you end uh, because obviously you're not going to take this all the way out it's um you start with an idea <clears throat> situation with characters you're not going to take it you know the way you would uh, a novel all the way to the conclusion um, but there is some conclusion uh it's just maybe one that suggests something bigger um but yeah i'm i'm, I'm struggling with that idea right now yeah, it's, I just find it interesting because sometimes you see people who definitely are sh- strong. I, I don't know. I, I haven't read that much. But it's just with Swanwick, he re- his first novel, um, Stations of the Tide, I think was written by somebody else than him. Yeah. Um, because it, it it is 
it is so different from everything else he wrote. It is so exquisite. It's such a great novel. Um, it's like um, it's like uh, uh, the Wind Up Girl. Mm-hmm. In some ways, it's about it's about the 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 col- the representative from a higher authority going through the jungle or going through some uh, going through some uh, colonial country to track down some evildoer or something like that. But it's it's magnificent. It's a magnificent book. Um, and then he wrote a whole bunch of like the Iron Dragon's Daughter, and um, he wrote a whole series of books, and they're all fun. Mm-hmm. But his short stories are just right. outrageously good. Right. Outrageous. His novels are just merely good, even great. But his short stories, when he is on, he is ridiculously on. To my, to me, I, mean, I don't know. You know, I don't know what anybody else thinks, but I tell you, certainly rocked my world. I should read more. Sh- we should read more short stories. But yeah. Um, um... And also, you know, uh, Lionel and Jim's uh, taste in everything is uh, not representative of uh, anybody else's taste, nor should they be. There's another disclaimer. I just figure I'll put them to oh, yeah. the podcast. You know, um, we're just we're just two dilettantes, <laughs> 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 rolling tape. But hopefully, hopefully, turning people onto some things that we really love. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, isn't that really what a lot of us, you know, hope to do? Which is, we hope that. Some people will refer, you know, other people will plow some corner of a field somewhere and say, hey, look, I found something really great here that yeah. I think you might really enjoy. I mean, who 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 doesn't like that? And hopefully we can do the same. So uh, I think, yeah, I think Swanwick's stories are absolutely worth anybody's invitation. Um, and, you, and you, you know, I mean, Swanwick is not necessarily a writer that you've heard of. Um, I, I ran into him at a science fiction convention. I didn't actually introduce myself. I didn't, you know, stop him or anything. I was completely starstruck by a guy who really could walk all the way through a science fiction you know, uh, convention and not necessarily get stopped by anybody. Um, but his work is just so, it's just so darn good. Yep. It's yeah. great. So what else do you want to, what do, what yeah, do we got? I, what, I don't have my next pivot ready. Um, I do at some point want to talk to you about um, the metaverse. Um, oh, you're talking about uh, Zuckerberg's thing? Yeah. With, uh, fa- I, know, I know Zippo about that. I'm sorry. Yeah. That doesn't That's stop a- us usually, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we can make stuff up. So Zuckerberg, so <laughs> there, is, there is a movie done about... Uh, the movie, The Social Contract, it's done about Facebook, and Trent Reznor did the soundtrack for that movie, and he used a special <laughs> keyboard. Right, right. He used a special keyboard. Oh, he used the Swarmatron by, uh, oh, by really? uh, Duanatron. <laughs> How about that? You like that one? I like you that. Like, I like you that. like that pinball? That's yeah, pretty he used, good. He used the Duanatron Swarmatron. Now, now, we're, now we're way off. Right. Everybody's. <laughs> and that yeah. will be the sound of the, of the metaverse. That and, and putting your drums through a distortion pedal. Um, I'll take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I've 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 studious, studiously avoided Facebook. I have a page because I didn't want somebody taking Lionel Cass <laughs> on Facebook. Um, I updated once about five years ago. I think I posted photos of me biking somewhere in San Antonio. And that was the end of that. You probably have a lot of uh, invites to um, neo Nazi oh, yeah. groups. Yeah. There's all kinds of there's all kinds of things on my Facebook page. <laughs> I just I wish I could just pour concrete all. I wish there's just a way to go to Facebook and say, look, I just want to register my name. I don't want a page. I don't want anything else. I just want to yeah. register my name and keep it there. And I don't know if I don't know if they're really thrilled about that. Uh, that, that idea. Yeah, they're they're not into that. They're not. They're they into wanna... engagement. They want yes. to be engaged. They do. Which means they want you to be pissed off. Yeah, mostly. That's that's pretty much it. And so I'm wondering, like, so if we're all going to kind of, you know, spend time in this three, three-dimensional three hallucination um, of Facebook, what, will we just be fighting? I mean, are we just going to be get constantly at war with each other there? Or, you know, building up our armies to attack each other? What's the plan? What are you I talking about? Are they proposing know. some kind of virtual reality? Oh, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Oh, it's, it's, it's full-on... Um, Neuromancer. I mean, he's 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 changed the name of the company to Meta. 
Um, he's he's working on basically you know everybody wearing Oculus Rift all the time and and being in this hallucination of a social network. Ready Player One. Yeah. Or just a ton of other books, really. Which is a fun book, by the way. Ready Player One was a fun book. It's, I it didn't read. Tw- I I watched the movie, unfortunately. I didn't read the book, and I should have read the book because I did not like the movie. It was, yeah, it's it had all the all the key elements, but it's a it's a nostalgia book. There's definitely right. a lot of nineteen eighties nostalgia in that book. So I think there's probably a lot of people who just find it totally annoying. Um, <laughs> and uh, but. Yeah, I don't know about that virtual reality thing. So he wants everybody to have goggles on all the time and I, walking yes, around? I think. I mean, nobody really knows yet. But, um, you yeah, know, he has some vision about, you know, what the future is. And it's it's the immersion thing. It's the full immersion uh, environment. I just, you know what? Um, when I'm When I'm interacting with other people's comments and reading what they're doing and looking at their walls or whatever, I don't want to be seen. I don't want to be, although I am, right? Obviously, I'm seen by Facebook. But I don't want to be seen by them. Uh, I, w- I would like that remove. I like, but, you know, I'm old. So maybe it's, maybe it's very attractive to, uh, to younger people. Maybe this is his play for the next generation. Is yes, I agree. They'll want to be old. fully in it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. I had to do that one. I don't know. I mean, I sometimes ask my daughter about this. She's 17. I say, you know, and and... But the problem is, it's, it's me, right. a father, an elderly yeah. man, asking his daughter, "What do you think?" So, uh, are you going to get? His, are you, uh, there, there's so much distortion in that line of communication. Who knows? Um, but she certainly, you know, she certainly spends a lot of time looking at TikTok. Facebook is considered. I mean, Facebook is not. Yeah, that's old people not, stuff. That's old. Yeah. That's what old people do. Yeah. It's like shortwave radio. It's like something your dad does out in the garage <laughs> with vacuum tubes. That would be great. If you had to get on like a shortwave radio for Facebook, that would be pretty cool. Actually. Yeah, you have to learn Morse code first. Then you have to yep. get your you have to get certified by the American Radio Relay League and get your Morse code license before you can you can get a frequency. Yeah, that'd be Steampunk good. Steampunk social media. That sounds Steam- much more interesting. Steam powered. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know about Meta, but uh, Dorsey, Dorsey, uh, the head of Twitter, yeah, he's resigning. Down. Yeah, he's stepping down. That's an uh, odd. That's an odd. I mean, I suppose he he can. It's not, you know, it won't really change his lifestyle, except that he won't be involved in the decision making. I'm just kind of wondering what happened. Is there any discussion of that? Have you seen anything? I haven't looked. I, I've, I, I, of course, I, I read from uh, the my Pravda, which is the New York Times, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they had some some stuff about how he's also the CEO of a company called Square, Square hmm. Payments, and people felt he 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 was CEO of Twitter and left at some point, and then was and then came back, and now they want him to leave again. Uh, and and some people stated that his his uh, passions and energy are split between Twitter and Square. I, what I remember is that during the uh, the recent election, Twitter was much more activist about things than Facebook was. Like Twitter was shutting down people's Twitter accounts. I mean, yeah, yeah. Didn't Twitter like shut down the presidents? They both I did. I mean, shut down But Donald Twitter Trump's. did it first, yeah. Twitter did it yeah. first. Yeah, and so I think um, that must have been, uh, it must have been um, an exciting ride mm-hmm. at Twitter making those kind of decisions um, to shut down accounts and do those kind of things. So I'm sure that took its toll. Um, but other than that, I have no idea. Again, lots of theories, no evidence. Right. Um so I don't, you know, the whole social. But I mean, honestly, uh, what I hear is that TikTok is like king of the planet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I opened an account, um, and um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I mean, it, you know, it doesn't hold my attention, but I'm sure I can kind of see why it would. You know, it just seems like it's a, it's a lot of couples slapping each other on the ass, and you know, for laughs. Oh, good. Where do I sign up for that? Yeah. What's the uh, TikTok.com? TikTok. <laughs> yeah. It's um it's spyware that you install yourself. So you just um you just yep. go ahead and give it permission to yep. you know, see everything. And what uh, is what's the phrase? What did was it was it that science fiction author that we will not 
name. <laughs> uh, weapon I don't know which one we're boredom. Gibson. Uh, S- something is weaponized boredom. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah, that, you know, it's, it's you, yeah, it's all spyware. It's all, it's all surveillance wear. It's a question of, see, this is, this is something I actually know like 5% of, which is cybersecurity. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's all being tracked. But anyway, that's a silly comment. Um, no, but, I mean, no, I think that, I think that, I think that is, that's an informed comment. I, I, I feel like we kind of know that, and yet we still, use these things and um we are um really hungry for that little bit of engagement well what i'm really worried about is my is my google homes hmm. the the little devices for like the alexas i guess is what they're yeah. called um and and you know it's a little thing where you shout out loud and say hey you know okay blah 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 you know right. open a can of peas or something like that it does something <laughs> they're always listening they are. They're, they're always not, listening. I thought they were not supposed to be always listening. Well, maybe they're not supposed to be. And maybe they're not always listening. Right. And maybe they're listening, but they, they have to always be listening because if they weren't, they wouldn't know to react to what you say. So the device itself is right. always recording your voice unless you push the little button on the side that turns the microphone off, which you can do. Huh. On, the, on the side of a Google Home, there's a button that turns the microphone off. Right. I mean, it sort of defeats the purpose of the whole right. thing. Well, it doesn't defeat the entire purpose, but it defeats most of the purpose of it. Um, Which is that you don't have to get up off the sofa to yes. to order a pizza. A noble and and a very <laughs> valued thing in my universe, okay? Right. <clears throat> but the whole point is that you can turn the microphone. Like, for example, what I use my Google Homes mainly for is for playing radio stations. I know. I'm pathetic, but I, I say, I, I only say three things in my Google Home in the last 10 years, which is, you know, blah, 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 please play this radio station. Um, and it plays it. So I could theoretically, after I say that, I could turn it off. But that means getting off my ass, walking over to the Google Home and right. pressing the little button, then forgetting I've pressed that button, sitting down, and then when I want to turn off the radio, I, I yell at the Google and it doesn't respond. And I, I curse, and then I get back up, and i got to walk over to Google Home and turn it back on again, and then I leave it on forever. But the key thing is that it's hearing everything. Yeah. It's hearing everything that you mutter to yourself mm. when, you, when you think nobody's around. Um, it hears every bodily noise that you make. Mm. It hears every time you open the refrigerator door and close it. It's fascinating. I mean, all joking aside, I think if you had access to all that audio data, you could make some really interesting observations about human society. Really interesting observations about human society. I mean, the whole point is, what if you find correlations between things? Yeah, if people start muttering this, and they open the refrigerator tor- door four times between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. Zulu, right. that means X with a 90% certainty. What do you do with that information? Well, you sell things to people, I think. It's the main right. thing right now. Um, yeah, you're right. you're you're hungry at this time of the day. And, to a certain um, degree, to a certain degree, that's the that's the good news. Right. The good news is that the person who's collecting this stuff is probably just perfectly fine. Just saying, look, you know, do you do you want an Eskimo pie? I got one right here. <laughs> but well, if you yeah. weren't if you weren't trying to sell something, and you had access to that data, what would you find out? What would you discover about mankind? I bet you'd discover some mighty interesting things. I really do. I, I just think it'd be, and that's scary. Yeah. Because you might discover things that when you tell it to people, they're like, I don't want to hear this anymore. I don't want to know this. It's like somebody who says, I know when you're going to die. Right. Do you really want to hear that? Do you really want to know that? Right. Probably not. So you can have a countdown clock. It's like, surprise me, okay? <laughs> Just let it be your little secret, you know? But honestly, it, it, it opens up a very interesting philosophical question. I bet you, you could crank, you could crunch, because basically we're all being surveilled and monitored to a degree that would have made George Orwell blush. Right. Yeah, he never, 
I right. think he never really and more of, more importantly, we're not only record we're recording everybody's at least in audio we're recording a vast number of people every audio interact especially since the pandemic when most people are spending their lives in their homes and these things are very sensitive i can shout at the at the google home from another room over um and it will hear me and it will do something so obviously the audio processing algorithms are really good yeah. so they're capturing every fart well now they're, are they so? Th- this is where I want to uh, between our, this conversation and the next conversation. I want to do some fact checking, at least in terms of what Google is saying they're doing, because my understanding is all of these have to start with a, you know, um, hey Barbara, you know, like uh, it has to start with a particular utterance that you train it to recognize, and then it starts recording what you're, you know, to analyze what you're, what no. you say after that. Because how does it know? How does it know to record? If I say the magic phrase, I'm not going to say it because I'll, I'll set off all the devices right. in my house, but it has to be listening all the time. Right. But could it be the just The microphone sampling? has to be on. Yeah. It is. It's sampling. Yes, it yeah. absolutely is. There's a microphone on and there's a sampler running. Right. And there's a process running on the device and it's constantly looking at the audio stream coming in in real time, looking for a key phrase. And when it sees, okay, <laughs> Yeah. When it sees that phrase, then it's then what it does is it says, I'm going to consider any string of phonemes that follows that as a legitimate request for action on my part. But the key thing is that the device is always the microphone's always on. Right. Once you turn it off, the microphone's always on and it's always there's always some local thing. But I don't think it's a local thing because Honestly, the processing power required to turn an audio stream into something – this is a good question. This would be a good question for Google. Right. Are they are – they, is that device reaching out to the Google supercomputing cloud to say, did in fact Lionel Katzen just say the magic word or right. not? Or does it have enough intel- – I think it has enough intelligence locally. I think because what it does is it probably records like 20 different variants of me saying, okay, nah, nah, nah. And right. then what it does, it just it has enough processing power locally on the device to compare the two things together. So I think yes, I, I think if Google says that they're not they're not storing this stuff anywhere, I might believe them. I might not. I know oh, Apple sure Apple says they're not storing it. It's um, easy to test. I don't know about Google. It's easy to test. I mean, I'm sure there's. I mean, a home hobby is what you do is you just you would you would um, you would uh, You'd have a, a packet sniffer mm-hmm. between the Google Home um, and your router. Uh, well, yeah, you'd have to. It'd be a wireless packet sniffer, right. and you'd see if the Google's like if you'd see the, if the Google Home is constantly cranking out a steady one megabit per second stream. Or, right. But honestly, audio is not a lot. Hmm. You can do it with like ninety-two kilobits. Uh, I mean, with a fairly small stream, but you could detect it. I think if I think even you and you and I could detect this if we were really determined to do it. We could see if the Google Home was constantly streaming all the audio files off to Google. But that's all irrelevant because whether they're doing it or not, I don't really care. I mean, honestly, <laughs> I don't really care if they are or not. What I'm saying is that that is an unbelievable treasure trove of data. Right. Right. It is an absolutely mind boggling. You could solve crimes. Mm hmm. You could tell right. people you need to go to the doctor right now and tell them you have hemochromatosis. <laughs> I'm serious. They're close. I mean, right now Google's doing th- Google watches when people Google anal- very heavily analyzes the the search terms that people right, put into course. Google searches. Yeah. Google. I mean, this is this is public knowledge. Google routinely communicates with the Centers for Disease Control, saying, "Hey, I think we have a flu outbreak." in this county in Georgia. Right. Because everybody's typing this particular search. A lot of people in Mar- in this county in Georgia are typing in this search or this count ca- or this the northern part of this state. Everybody's typing in this thing. I think we got something going on there, so you may want to check on that. And that's because they're just looking at search trends. But if you could actually listen to everybody wheezing and coughing and farting yeah. and slurping and yelling at their kids and their kids yelling at them and the dog you know, the, the dog chewing its food, if you collected all the... Fascinating question. If you collected all the audio data 
from our lives and our homes, what could you tell us about ourselves? Well, in this case, uh, Google could tell you that you are trying to make a podcast with a friend of yours. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Was it bloviating dilettantes? No, I just can't remember. <laughs> Jack of all trades, masters <laughs> of none. Right. No, the problem with make, with naming a podcast now is that they're all taken because there are a billion. But if you if you were listening, you are our only listener, and we appreciate it. And we should probably end. So, okay. How do we end these? We say, um, "I'm Lionel. I'm Jim. Thanks. Uh, Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Out there in TV land, we love you." <laughs> Arrivederci.